The following is a production of Salt and Life Radio in Boise, Idaho. Kick off your work boots and pull up a boulder. It's time for Man Cave, discussing the issues that affect Catholic men in today's culture. Grab your favorite beverage, pick out a comfy spot around the campfire, and enjoy today's conversation with our two favorite cavemen, Pat King and Brian Howe. Hi, this is Pat King. Welcome to the Pat King's Man Cave Show. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about something I've said for quite a while now, since I returned to the, the church. Uh, when I when I was a practicing uh, non-denominational Christian, um, I, I, I their services were unfulfilling. There was a lot of Rah rah, sis boom ba, a lot of music, a lot of worship. That was all good. I I like worship, I like worship music. I like I like getting in the mood for a service. Uh, it was uh, exciting, exhilarating. But you, you can't live. I mean, that's why they have cheerleaders on the side of a a, a a football game or basketball game, and the teams down. The cheerleaders are trying to pick the crowd, keep them back up into it. And that's that's really what those worship services are. Those those hour-long free sermon worship hours were to get you in the mood, get you fired up. And the Catholic Church is far more subdued in the fact the Mass is, is the most important part of our Christian theology, our Christian basis. But it's not the main thing. I mean, it's the main thing, but it's not the quintessential item that'll provide you the knowledge and the scope and the depth and the depth of your spirituality. And I've said this before, and I say this all the time, you'll you'll not get everything you need to know from just going to Mass. I love the Mass. I, I, it's very reverent for me, but it's a time of quiet reflection for me when I come in. I come in about a half an hour to 45 minutes early. I actually lead a um, Knights of Columbus, lead the rosary. For anyone that's wanting to come in before just a half hour before Mass, it's a scriptural rosary. Um, and I come in even before that to, to read up on the, the readings of the day. Uh, I have my own missile. Uh, it's out in my car. Um, I have my own wrist missile, so I'm, I'm reading the read the commentaries, uh, the theme of the Mass of the week, and then and then the readings and then all the commentaries about the how they all theme together, how they all come together. For the for the whole theme of the the season of the mass for that specific time period of the year of the of the ABCD ABC year, and so I'm always focusing in on the mass, and the mass is beautiful because you've got the readings, you've got scripture, you've got two parts of the mass, you got the scripture, and then you've got the the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. You've got the Eucharist. The, Christ's passion, his sacrifice, his gift to us. But, and, and I leave fulfilled in that part of it. But what is at, said at the end of every single Mass, whether it's a daily Mass or it's a Sunday Mass, those are obligations. The, the Masses are, the Sunday Mass is an obligation. The weekday Mass is not. Um, so, but what, is, what does every Mass end with? It says, you are dismissed. Go forth and spread the good news. Spread the gospel. Disciple others. Teach others. You're called to go forward and spread the word. Spread the gospel. Spread Jesus' message. Show them through love, through charity, through almsgiving, through through penance and sacrifice on your own part, through every every aspect of your life on a regular hour by hour, day by day basis, should have a focus. Have should have some meaning, even in your enjoyment, your leisure should have some meaning coming from God. Whether it be, you know, thanking God for the. Beautiful day that you get to sit out in a beach chair and drink a beer and, and roast marshmallows around a campfire or whatever, or for the job you have for your health, for the air you breathe, for the wife, the children, the family, or everything 
you should always be thanking God for those blessings, those gifts. But you'll never feel it fully complete yourself, your, your journey in life. You'll never be fully satisfied by just going to Sunday Mass. I'm sorry. I, I, that's my opinion. Of course, it's my opinion. It's my podcast. And I don't think I'm saying anything out of line that just going to Sunday Mass is is just one out of one hour out of 163, 164 hours of a week. And when I returned to the church, the mass was like, wow, beautiful. I something I had longed for, something I didn't know I was missing until I was always longing for something. I was always, you know, that, that phrase long suffering. Those 25 or 30 years I was away from the church, I was a long suffering guy. I couldn't really put my finger on it why why I really wasn't very satisfied. Why material world, the material things, the, all my successes were not, they were just short term. They were short lived. They were, they, they were you know, getting that new car, that new truck, uh, buying that new piece of equipment for my landscape business. Uh, you know, uh, taking a, I didn't take many trips, but because we had a handicapped child and, and, and kids in school and sports, uh, we took as many trips as we could with the kids for their sports, but that was about it. Um, and after our son died, we tried to tri tri take trips, but they, again, they didn't fill that void of loss with the loss of our son. And, and quite frankly, your whole life really doesn't get fulfilled from just going to work or getting a paycheck or, or going snowmobiling or I, you know, whatever, whatever you like doing, you, you get a temporary satisfaction out of that, but you you know, you, you got to go out and repeat that. You know, like the back of the bottle shampoo says, uh, uh, wet, lather, rinse, repeat. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, you're always cleaning yourself. You're always cleaning your hair. You're always cleaning the dirt off. You're, you're, you're always cleansing yourself because you're, you're, you're never clean enough. You're, you're, you take a shower, you go out the next day, you're working and then you're dirty again. And you you bathe, you clean yourself far more regularly than you work on your soul, your spirit, your 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 spiritual intellect, your knowledge. Um, so when I returned to the church, I was I was on ball, a ball of fire. I I just didn't know where to direct my energies to. Um, I didn't know what would give me that that satisfaction, I, and I. I hungered for something. Uh, I was getting Christ's body. I was uh, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Uh, that was really awe, awe for in awe. I was just my heart was just in awe of that communion, that receiving, that gift that I had longed for uh, for thirty years, and yet that itself and this I see this in new converts to the to the church that unless they put time and effort into seeking more knowledge about God about the church about their faith if they aren't teaching it if they aren't being more involved than just going to Sunday mass they tend to drift away I see this time. I can't tell you how many converts I've seen over the. I've been back in the church uh, for eight, nine years now, coming on nine, and I'm 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 as fired up about my faith now as I was when I brought came into the church, came back to the church, but not in the same way. the The way I the way I have come to appreciate the mass now is the fact that I've done more with what the mass has given me, that, that freedom of, of doing the right thing, of doing what's best, my relate working on my relationship with God. You know, I mean, God loves you, but he can't do the work to get to know him better. He knows you. He wants you 
to chase him and get to know him. Um, he's he's chased you all your life, but now it's your turn to start going. Okay, God. Ha, okay, great aunt, great question. What do you want to? What do you want me to do for, with my life? What where do you want me to go? You you don't you don't just sit on a on a rock because my man cave show would say sit on a rock and think about it and say oh I know where to go now thank you God you know it it, it only comes in your quest for searching for more knowledge more truth more not more truth so much as more depth of that truth you know the truth but now you need to get to know that truth you get to know. There's 2,000 years of history, 2,000 years of very smart men, very people that were there at Christ's walk, and, 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 and they wrote things down, and they tell stories, and they passed it on to their disciples, and, and, and trained up bishops, and, and priests, and deacons, and spread the gospel to heathens, and pagans, and, and Jews, and and Muslims and all of the other types of religions and or the lack thereof religions, agnostics and all that, people that didn't have a belief in a God. And they, they spread that on. So they were always working to spread that gospel and that knowledge. And yet we just think by going to mass, ah, we're gonna, I'm a good Catholic. I know everything about the church. Except for when someone asks you a tough question. Well, what does the church think about this? Uh uh, you know, you know, uh, I, I don't know. And neither you say nothing. And then they go like, what do you know about your own faith? Or you say something that's like wrong or not quite right or heretical or something because you don't know. And, and that's, that's the challenge. That's the problem with, with, it's not, a, it's not even a lack of catechesis. It's a lack of your desire to want to know more. I got Baltimore Catechism. I had all this rote memory. So when I left the church in my early 20s, I was like 24, 25. When I left the church, for I've, I've mentioned on my other episodes, but quite frankly, it was, it was Vatican II, but it wasn't because of Vatican II. It was what a lot of priests did with what they do or thought or wanted to know or the way they wanted to take it or their mis misinterpretation or the misinformation they were fed about what Vatican II was trying to do. Now, I, I'm not a, I've never read the whole, I studied Vatican II as a in a youth group, but that was a long time ago. And I don't think we got all the way, uh, maybe we got halfway through, but it, um, what it tried to do was spread the, the 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 mass the way I understand it was they tried to make it simpler for people to understand and be more participatory in uh I, I give you lots of examples of why I like the novus order in my own language because I I I, I grew up in the Latin mass and quite honestly I can't all I recall is some of the actions of the priests but I didn't understand the mass. We weren't taught Latin. I'm 61 years old. We were we weren't even taught Latin. It wasn't even a, a second language or a, a study as a regular school uh, in classes as, as a grade school. So not like it was 25, 30 years before that. So, but I, I can tell you, for example, uh I've got a friend. You've had he was on my episode. I don't know which one, uh about eight or seven or eight ago, a father Francis Adiana from Ghana, Africa. And uh he speaks English. Now Ghana is a is a was a British colony at one point. So they were taught in, uh, English, British uh, British language. And so but there are still dialects in the African people and yet the fastest growing segment of the Catholic Church is in Africa. And why? Because the Mass is being delivered to them in the language they understand. And you only have to go back to the the uh, tongues of fire at, at, at Pentecost. 
as as to what the what the message of Pentecost was, the way I take it, was that they they the the tongues of fire, the the wind blew into that house and, and uh, as a great powerful wind from heaven and these tongues of fire came and landed on each of the apostles and and then they went out and spoke to all to men of all the nations of the world were there so not everybody spoke the same language i think greek or arabic was the language of the time but they 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 all spoke language of uh, tongues of every country and every nation they were from and they were Men from all over the world there assembled, listening to the apostles speak clearly in the language they understood. They got the message of God in their own tongue, their own language. And 3,000 of those various men from all over the world came into the church, became Christian because of that. And to me, that's a pretty good indication that the mass is supposed to be delivered in the language of the people you're, you're trying to convert or bring into the church or help to grow in their faith in the church. So if you were to force everybody to come in and, and, and hear nothing but the Latin mass, you're going to get a lot of people says, I'm sorry. I mean... I don't even know how to speak Spanish or French or any other language. You want me to learn Latin, which is a tough language to learn? I, I don't think you're going to grow the church that way. I don't think you're going to get a lot of converts. That, you will get some, absolutely. You'll get some that think it's reverent or beautiful or whatever. And I think the Latin Mass, I have nothing against it whatsoever. I think it's a beautiful Mass. But I think if we went back to the Latin mass as a only mass option. I don't think you'd get, I, I, I think you'd lose a lot of people. Um, I would leave because I'm there to see Jesus, spend time with Jesus. I don't really care what anybody else is there for. It's, it's my connection, my relationship with Jesus. That's what I'm going for. So, so you have to do more on your own to grow in your faith, to grow in your in the knowledge of your faith, to grow in your depth. So when I when I came back to the church and and the, the three or four, five, six months later, um, I was fortunate that I I was just dumb enough. <laughs> um, uh, someone had come up, they said they were in desperate need of, of teachers for uh, confirmation classes. And I thought, you know, I I volunteered for a lot of things when I first returned to the church, St. Vincent de Paul and Vincentian, uh, Knights of Columbus. And then what happened, I got too strung out with so many other activities. I'm still self-employed and I'm not retired. And so it really put a damper on my earning wages, my income, and made it very difficult for me to do my job properly. And I, it was starting to hurt my business, so I had to step back on a few things. Um, but anyway, uh, but but after about four or five months of really feeling that, that, that warm, new, returning Catholic fuzzies, it was kind of that next question, what's, what next, what now? How do I grow in my faith? And fortunately... When when Daniel Miller asked me to to uh, well he asked for volunteers and I came, stepped up and and I became a teacher of confirmation I did that for I don't know five six years I learned a lot about my faith now I was taught you know back in the in the seventies uh, in, in cate you know, CCD Baltimore Catechism sixties and seventies and it was every Wednesday night. From six to seven, I believe. And you had classes like, you know, all classrooms, you went to class like a regular school student, but you went on Wednesdays. And it was mandatory. At least my mom told me it was mandatory. <laughs> she may have been lying to me. 
but we all win. Every one of those kids did. And uh, I got I got confirmed at 14, but I had to, my mom still made me go to catechism, uh, even on Wednesdays up till my senior year in high school, which was fine. Um, uh, but, and I, and, and so, but it, when he asked, when he needed volu- asked for volunteers, and I stepped up and, and I became a volunteer. It was really, I couldn't believe how much I learned my, f- more about my faith and the meaning of the faith and, you know, simple things like I, I I probably knew this, but I didn't recall it. But the you know, Catholic is not a faith denomination. Catholic is not a religion. Catholic means universal. Um, uh, it means universal Christian. If you're uh, back before the the, the Protestant uh, split, it was. Uh, if you were a Christian, you were a Catholic because it meant universal church. People get weirded out. Catholic, I'm a Catholic. Oh, I'm a Christian. <laughs> just, okay, I belong to the universal Christian church that Christ started. And and so, uh, but I didn't. I don't recall hearing that message. So I thought Catholic was different than, you know. Methodist or Nazarene or Baptist, and you know, so you you get where I'm going with this. Uh, a Catholic Church is the universal Christian Church. Roman Catholic Church just means everybody who's a Christian who believes in the same tenets, baptized the same way, participates in the Eucharist the same way. They're all uh, Catholic. They're all Christian. Anyway. Now, you can split hairs with me, that's fine. But I, I learned a lot about my faith, the depth of it, the, the more, more meaningful part of confirmation and what it meant to be confirmed and, and, and that aspect. It's not a coming-of-age adult thing. It means that you're, you've taken on that next step where the Holy Spirit is, is now a part of you. You've accepted it. You, you seek it. But... Why people leave the church after that and go into college is because they're not doing anything more to further their faith, to further their knowledge of their faith. It, it takes effort and time to gain more depth of the understanding of the faith that you've been given by study, by reading, by by being involved, um, I know that uh, uh, Catholic Church doesn't do a great job of of continuing the education of their youth once they get confirmed and get out of high school. There's a big gap between that and when they come back to decide to get married. They want to get married in the church. It's really the first time that they're asked to do anything after confirmation is to take marriage prep classes or baptism classes. Um, RCIA wasn't anything, wasn't any, wasn't around at the time that I was leaving the church. Uh, so I did, when I was getting, when I was getting married, I, I brought my then to be wife in to meet a priest. And he was, he was a wackadoodle. I don't even think he's a, I think he's been lay aside, the, but he was a wackadoodle. I mean, he just had these very weird ideas of of the faith and and you know God the tree has a soul and God's in the tree and you hug a tree and you have a harmonic convergence with God and oh I mean it was just and it was two out two two and a half hours of that and when we were done my soon to be wife was is that the church? And I said not one I recognized. And so we actually made a, a a decision to to then it's like if this is what they're teaching, if this is the depth of the church, <laughs> I'd rather find something that's a little more on the more doctrinal or more conservative side of preaching than than that. And and it, his masses were kind of wackadoo. Like I went there because I was young and single, and it was at a it was a it was a Newman Center, it was a college campus, and and you go you wonder how kids get messed up and leave the church when this is what they've been taught, what they're going to be taught and they're eight in their older years.
Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Man Cave, a weekly podcast discussing the issues that affect Catholic men in today's culture. A production of Salt and Light Radio in Boise, Idaho. To learn more about our ministry, please visit our website, saltandlightradio.com.